Hello, we are going to study the key technologies of WLAN. We've mentioned many technologies previously, but haven't delved into them. We've just touched on them. Actually, we'll integrate all these technologies into the final chapter. We need to look at the TCP IP peer model for WLAN key technologies. The 802.11 standard primarily focuses on the bottom two layers of the TCP IP peer model. We can see a bunch of physical layer technologies. 802.11 has different encoding and modulation techniques. OFDM is one such modulation technique. Above is the MAC layer technology of 802.11. Above the MAC layer, there is an LLC layer, but these are all data link layer technologies. They mainly handle channel access, polling, data frame validation, error detection, security mechanisms, etc. The physical layer mainly handles the transmission of bit streams over the air. That is, the physical layer primarily deals with the transmission of data and the customization of bandwidth. The data link layer mainly implements various functions. Next, let's look at what key technologies are used in the peer model. First are the key technologies of the physical layer, OFDM, Orthogonal Frequency Division, Multiplexing Technology. The second is OFDMA Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access and MIMO technology. Technologies at the MAC layer include CSMA, CA, RTS, CTS, interframe spacing, channel bonding, frame aggregation, and block acknowledgement. These are some of the main technologies that might be used in the wireless domain. Let's first look at the physical layer technologies. In 802.11, the wireless physical layer uses three different technologies, mainly modulation technologies, including frequency hopping, direct sequence, and orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. The first two are basically obsolete, so we should mainly focus on OFDM. So what is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing? What are the concepts of orthogonal division and multiplexing? First, we need to understand orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. It is a multi-carrier coordination or modulation technology. Initially, plain sinusoidal waves carry no information, hence we need to modulate them before transmission. It's important to note that we usually refer to all these waves as subcarriers. We introduce a new concept called side carriers. Essentially, side carriers are subcarriers modulated to a degree that allows them to be easily distinguished from each other. That is, after modulation, subcarriers turn into side carriers. How do they differentiate from each other? Look at this diagram. There are three side carriers. This is side carrier one, this is side carrier two, and this is side carrier three. How do they transmit data simultaneously without interfering with each other? They do this by modulation, maintaining an orthogonal relationship at all times. For instance, when wave one reaches its peak, waves two and three are at zero. This means at that moment, only wave one exists. When wave two is at its peak, waves one and three are zero, maintaining this condition constantly. Waves one, two, and three take turns transmitting. This method is called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM. Thus, multiple overlapping subcarriers can transmit data simultaneously, and since they are orthogonal to each other, there is no interference. This is OFDM technology. Let's look specifically at the application of OFDM technology in the 5G spectrum. For instance, as mentioned earlier, there are a total of 52 channels or subcarriers. Each subcarrier is 312.5 kilohertz. Here we see 48 channels are used for data transmission, and four channels are used for phase reference. Not for data transmission, these are the usable subcarriers. This is the basic scenario of OFDM technology. Let's look further at the specific modulation method. OFDM uses QAM, which is Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. Currently, we mainly use this technology. Other technologies like BPSK and QPSK are less used now, though they were used in previous protocols. For QAM, you can see that 1024 QAM, compared to 256 QAM, increases each spatial stream's rate by 25%, because in the same area, for instance, here is a module with 256 QAM, four modules stacked together are even larger 
This is the modulation technique for subchannels in OFDM. This utilizes amplitude and phase to achieve the transmission of information. Let's examine what OFDMA technology is. OFDMA is a new technology introduced in Wi-Fi 6, known as Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access. As previously mentioned, within Wi-Fi 6, we have reduced the bandwidth each subcarrier can carry from 312.5 kHz to 78.125 kHz. Why do this division? In Wi-Fi 5, users were distinguished by different times, where each time slice, a user fully occupies all subcarriers and sends a complete data packet. As you can see, different colors represent different users. User 1 finishes, then user 2 follows, then user 3 and user 4, meaning within a single time, only one user transmits. But in Wi-Fi 6, we fragment the channel resources. This time frequency resource block, also known as RU resource unit, we have defined seven different types of RUS, namely 26 tone RU, 52, 106, 242, 484, 996, 2 times 996. A user can use multiple RUs simultaneously to transmit data. Up to 37 users can concurrently transmit. The aim is to significantly enhance our resource transmission efficiency. In fact, the core concept of Wi-Fi 6 is multi-user communication. This is its core concept. This is the OFDMA technology. Everyone can transmit simultaneously without having to queue and compete, improving efficiency and reducing latency, etc. This is why OFDMA is suitable for scenarios with large transmission volumes of small data packets because its bandwidth is very small. Next are the different types of RU classifications. The table below shows the maximum number of RUs for different channel bandwidths. A bandwidth of 20 MHz can support 9 RUs. If it is 40 MHz, it expands further. At 160 MHz, it can support the maximum RU. This is a concept of orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Next, let's discuss the technologies of the 802.11 MAC layer. Firstly, it's important to note, in WLAN, only one station can transmit data at a time, thus necessitating a channel allocation mechanism to coordinate when each station can send and receive data. There are two types of coordination. One is called distributed coordination function, which actually uses CSMA slash CA. The other is point coordination function. We will not discuss point coordination. We'll focus on distributed coordination function. This is carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, which means if you want to send data, you first need to check, is this channel free? Can I use it? If it is free, I need to apply. If I'm using it, Others can't use it. They must wait until I'm done. This is the channel contention mechanism implemented in the Mackie layer. Let's take a closer look at CSMACA. Firstly, CS stands for carrier sense, which involves listening before sending data to ensure the line is free, reducing conflicts. The second is MA, which stands for multiple access where data sent by one station can be received by multiple stations simultaneously. And finally, collision avoidance, which is part of our protocol's design, designed to avoid conflicts. We'll look specifically at how to avoid this later. Starting with an important concept, RTS and CTS. These two concepts are very important. You should be familiar with them. When you connect a device to an AP, if the device wants to communicate, for instance, Device 1 sends an RTS frame, which stands for Request to Send, a Request to Send frame. When the AP receives this request, it responds. The AP responds to the RTS frame with a CTS frame, allowing the transmission. This place CTS is not sent unicast, but is broadcast. After broadcasting, if there are other devices nearby, like Device 2, when Device 2 receives the CTS, it remains silent allowing the transmitting device to complete the transmission of the data frame. After which, there's an ACK, which is the acknowledgement frame. This is the RTS and CTS mechanism. There's a special point here. Because of this mechanism, when you initiate an RTS request, if there are two or more devices, bandwidth will decrease, like at bus stations or high-speed train stations. With many users connected, this will greatly waste bandwidth, 
For example, a single AP user wanting to enjoy 5 megabits per second bandwidth. A single AP's load may not allow more than 30 users. This is also why Wi-Fi 6 was reduced. Due to the negative impact of many users, this is RTS and CTS. Their impact on our bandwidth is very significant. Also, think about when you are sending RTS. If there are 100 devices sending RTS at the same time, there will definitely be an impact. So actually, we have another mechanism called the interframe space. When sending RTS, there's a specific time interval. Or when the AP receives an RTS, it must reply with a CTS. And we need to have a waiting period. How long to wait? This is the interframe space called IFS. In IFS, we mainly focus on two parameters. One is called SAFS, short interframe space. The waiting time is very short, 16 microseconds. This is for 802.11 AX. This is the wait time before sending various control frames after waiting. Then sending data, the second is DIFS, Distributed Coordination Function. Interframe space. This is used when sending frames, for instance, on channel one, just finished sending data. Can it immediately send another RTS request? It cannot. It must wait for a diffs before it can send another RTS. That's how RTS is sent again.